Well, I'm here with Joe Tantillo, who's standing for DoRep. Although you only put your nomination in uh, a few hours ago, it's Thursday today. When did you decide to nominate yourself for this position? So I've been decided for about two weeks, fully decided. Um, been thinking about it, however, much longer than that for a couple of months, but I felt that it was better to just kind of keep it to myself and make sure that this was my decision. I really didn't want any outside influence from friends or family. I wanted to take the time and make sure that this was the right thing to do for me and make sure that I believe that this was the right thing to do for St. Andrews students. You really wanted to be president though, didn't you? You know, I did want to be president, although that's in the past. Um, I'm running for Doe Rep now. My heart is in this race and this is the job I want, and I can promise St. Andrews students that I will work tirelessly, tirelessly for them. Uh, but do you see what it looks like? You've nominated a few hours before the end of nominations. It looks as if you're completely undecided whether you actually want this job. I understand that. Uh, unfortunately, the conversation about me and president wouldn't even be a thing if there hadn't been I think a lot of people article. knew you were planning on standing for president. I, I think people knew. I'm, I'm afraid the conversation was made more public than I would have preferred it to be and unfortunately it was put out there and kind of my ability to negotiate what I was going to do was taken away. Um, the fact of the matter is that I'm not standing for that position. I'm standing for this one. This is what I want to do. It's that simple. So let's talk about one of the big things you've done as association chair. That was the That's Union campaign. Yes. Do you think it was appropriate to spend £242 on t-shirts? I think that the spending was worth it. I think that this campaign was in its infancy, and we were kind of learning what would work, what wouldn't work. The t-shirts were a necessary part of what we were trying to do. They were really helpful in kind of getting the word out um, much better than flyering. 242 pounds worth of t-shirts. I realize that the sum of money seems like a lot, but we ran this campaign fully with the intention of doing it again in the future and having it something that could be built upon each and every year. So we saw the t-shirts as a lasting expense, a one-off, if you will. And you think that was a success to you? I think it had its, you know, its pros and cons. I think anything in its first year is going to run into a couple of hurdles here and there, but we got people talking about the union. I mean, it was an awareness campaign. and. Those who liked it and those who didn't were still both talking about it. I had a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, I didn't know this or I didn't know that. I've had heads of subcommittees say, somebody spoke up in a meeting today and corrected me on something because they actually learned a fact during that's union. So perhaps we didn't teach every single student what the union does, but that was never our intention. We just want to get students more involved and I'm pleased with what we were able to do. So your main selling point is obviously you've been association chair. You also include that you're captain of the ultimate Frisbee team on your manifesto. Uh, president, rather. Oh, president, Was sorry. previously, uh, last year. But what experience do you actually have of representation? We've got school presidents, we've got the LGBT president standing, uh, a senior student in halls. What experience do you have of representation? So I've been a class rep, and I actually did stand to be a school president at one time, though I was unsuccessful. Uh, so I was quite involved with representation in my first few years in St. Andrews. And uh, as far as chair goes, it's actually not uncommon for a chair to stand for Doe Rep. Amanda Litherland was chair uh, a few years back, and then she went on to stand for Doe Rep because you deal uh, so much with quite a lot of the things that the Doe Rep ends up dealing with anyway. They are your direct line manager. Uh, you have to learn, you know, the structures and the laws and all of these things that go into the representation. But do you think you have enough experience of education? Will you be able to run class rep training? I think so. I mean, I helped run training for counselors this year and I know enough about the system that I fully believe that I'm more than capable of doing so. And of course, at the end of the day, I'm a student as well. I know the problems that we face. You talk about reading week in your manifesto. Yes. But you don't actually have a policy on this. You say that it's a difficult thing, but you don't really have a policy about what you do about Reading Week. Mm -hmm. So in the manifesto itself, I express that Reading Week is one of those things that Doe Reps have been trying to bring back for a few years now. We all know how beneficial it was. If you were here when it was still a part of our first term, you know that it was a great way for, well, if you were a first year, you probably just went on a trip but or, or relaxed. Uh, and if you were a fourth year, you got some extra time to work on your assignments. I don't think that we need to stop working to bring it back. My initial plan would be to try to bring it back in its original form. Now, I realize that's a difficult task. And what I propose in the manifesto, more or less words, is that 
I think a possible alternative could be that each different school has sort of their own version of what Reading Week is, whether that's a lightened course load or perhaps uh, ex absence, excused absence from tutorials or lectures. Now, it will depend from school to school, of course. You have science students who have lectures and tutorials all the time and art students who have much less class time, but I think we can make it work. And I think it's really important for the students of St. Andrews to keep trying. Isn't that just moving the problem that there's a lot of work throughout the whole semester to another period of the semester? You might say there's a week where there's no deadlines, but then you put those deadlines the week before or the week after and you have even more deadlines in that week. Of course, a lot of it is just moving things around, but what was reading week? It was just a week off with no deadlines and no coursework and people enjoyed it. People expressed that they wanted it back. So if we can find an alternative to it or bring it back in its truest form, then I think that would be very beneficial. On deadlines, you say that you want flexible deadlines extended. You want it not just for people that are in the first team for sports, but mm -hmm. you want it for, and I quote, people that are involved in societies, theatre or volunteering. Mm -hmm. Who won't be included in that? So this is a proposal that I think is really important. However, it does need some fine tuning. Obviously, these aren't going to extend to every single person because then you just have a system where all deadlines are flexible and that, of course, doesn't work. However, I do think that the university would be open-minded to perhaps extending these flexible deadlines to students who are, for example, directing a piece of theater or who are putting on a conference for their society. Really large-scale things. And it's hard for me to say at this point what they would be open to. And but what the, they system, would the system at the moment works quite, it's fairly obvious who gets that. It's the first team people in sports clubs. Yes. Who's going to decide if I'm directing a play, but it's going to be a terrible play and no one's going to watch it? Do I still get a flexible deadline? I think it's a process of negotiation. We have to see what we're able to get. I think the university has set a precedent by saying that athletes can get this. They've said this is important enough to the student community that we need to extend these benefits to them. I don't see why theater and societies and volunteering aren't just as important as sport. And I think we should start considering giving these benefits to those students as well. You also talk about study space, this is something all the other direct candidates have talked about. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the library redevelopment, the proposed one, although we don't know the full proposals yet, do you think that's going to be enough or more is needed? It's hard to say. I think it comes down to whether or not the university is going to continue admitting more students down the line. I mean, any proposed redevelopment and expansion at this point is beneficial, considering the vast expansion of the student body that we've seen over the last couple of years. But if the university continues to just expand, 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 then adding more students than desks doesn't really help us, does it? So I think we need to find a proposal where they're willing to say, okay. But do you think the proposed library redevelopment of 300, 250 to 300 new study spaces, do you think that's enough or do you think more is required? I think more is required down the line. Down the line or, or, or now? <laughs> Absolutely now. I think as many as we can get now as possible. 300 is what they've proposed for the moment. Would love to negotiate to bring that up to more. But if, if they refuse, then you gotta keep negotiating and get more down the line. But yeah, it's, it, 300 is not enough. One of the other proposals in your manifesto is that you have an advisor for four years of your degree. Yes. What would happen if I changed degree? So I think, obviously, that's, that's the first obvious question. If you change degrees, potentially, depending on the degree, your advisor might be able to still advise you on both. I know there are a lot of professors in IR who are also very competent in psychology and history, so some people might be able to flip around a little bit. Of course, for those who change from, say, computer science to philosophy, there's going to be less uh, overlap between professors. So perhaps you change to just a different advisor in your second year if you switch from your first year and then you still have three years to build a relationship with that person. And I think the important part is the idea that they will be there all the time to give you guidance rather than the system we have now where it's just kind of, oh, welcome, Don't, I'm not going to ask you any questions about what you're studying or what you want to do when you're older, I'm just going to make sure that your timetable works and shuffle you out. Isn't the flip side of that though that if you have a terrible advisor, you can't change it? For four years of your degree, you're stuck with the same person telling you the same thing every time you you matriculate. I mean, surely if we implemented a system where we had four-year advisors, there would be the ability to switch if you really didn't get along with your advisor. The point would be for it to be helpful to students, so I, I wouldn't see a reason why we couldn't add something like that in. Something else in your manifesto that struck us was that you say you want more students on the university court. 
Yes. You want the other two sabbaticals on the university court. Mm -hmm. Have you got any indication from the university they might be willing to do that? No, honestly, I haven't. And I'll tell you why I put this in there. We've seen the housing protests recently, and we've seen a rise. That wasn't in... organized by the Students Association, though. No, it wasn't. But we've, we've seen a rise in student frustration with the university. So I thought to myself, what is a way to put students in a better position of a negotiation? And the first thing that came to mind is increase the amount of student representation on court. It's the highest governing body of the university. If we really want a bigger voice, it's an immediate way to do so. And I thought that the other two sabbatical officers were the first obvious choices to propose to join. But you've got no indication from the university that they're willing to do this, so they don't want to expand court. Why would the university want to do this? They may not, but I'm not running to represent the university, I'm running to represent the students and the Students Association. But I wouldn't have it have been expect. sensible to at least ask someone in the university, Lorna Milne or Louise Richardson, ask, do you think this might be possible? And then this comes back to the fact, when did you decide to run? Have, have you actually discussed any of this with any of your policies with the relevant people? Do you know if any of these are achievable? Yeah, absolutely. I've discussed it with plenty of people. We've got candidates that have been planning to run for a long time. Mm -hmm. and, and I have four years of experience in the union. I have served as a trustee of the association. I've served as the chair. I have more knowledge of how this building works than just about anyone else. I'm very aware of what I'm talking about. But uh, if you haven't discussed your manifesto and if you're not sure it's achievable, then that's going to count for nothing. Well, I have discussed my manifesto. I know quite a lot of it is achievable and just because it's well, a lot well, it's one of the, you, you have your main points highlighted in red and you, you say that you want more students on university court. Yes. But wouldn't it have been sensible to have discussed that with Lorna Milne or Louise Richardson? Sure. But I mean, how much opportunity do any of us have to go and speak to Lorna Milne and Louise Richardson? I know that they are feeling the frustration of the students. Why wouldn't it make sense to add additional representatives? I mean, it's a lofty, pro it, it is a big promise, don't get me wrong. I'm not unaware of the difficulties of adding students to court. It's a constitutional change, it, it, it's a lot of meetings, and there will be people that will be against it, but why should we not try, right? Why should we put ourselves at any more of a disadvantage? We need people who are willing to fight for the students. I, I just think it's a good idea, and I think it's worth fighting for. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you, Henry.